Uh, hi, my name is Bill Templeton. Uh, I'm originally from Schenectady, New York. Uh, I put uh, 23 years in the uh, Air Force. I was 18 years old when I joined in August of 1956, and I retired in August of 1979. Uh, originally, I went to Lackland Air Force Base for four weeks for basic military training. From there, I went on to Amarillo, Texas uh, for three months. Um, and I was training on the F-100C aircraft as a jet mechanic. And some of us got pulled out and had to go to Strategic Air Command. Uh, SAC had a get well project at the particular time and they were short of aircraft mechanics. So I ended up going to Homestead Air Force Base in uh, South Florida, which is 30 miles south of Miami, uh, in 19, February 1957. Uh, Homestead uh, was a dual wing base at the time. It had been a base in, during World War II and it reopened again in 1955. I got there in 57. It was a dual wing B-47 base so that meant we had uh, 60 bombers I believe on, on the base so it was quite a large ramp down there anyway. Um, there was a 379th bomb wing and a 19th bomb wing. I became a member of the 19th bomb wing. Um, and I was assigned to the 28th bomb squadron, which dated back to World War I Lafayette Escadrille, uh, where you get the old uh, bi-wing planes flying and the hat in the ring stuff. So it was quite an old outfit, quite a long history. Um, I was fortunate enough to get there early enough to go to on a TDY to Morocco for two months with a wing. Uh, shortly after that, they discontinued sending the entire wings over and just sent a contingency of, contingency of uh, troops over there to maintain the alert status of the aircraft. Uh, I worked on the B-47, uh, primarily doing post-flight inspections. Uh, later uh, on, they refined the system. They went, for, they dropped the 25-hour and 50-hour post flights from the aircraft, and they just went strictly to a 100, 300-hour post flight. So, those of us who were doing the, those and type inspections were moved to the 19th Periodic Maintenance Squadron. So, we worked in the nose dock doing 100 and 300-hour inspections. And part of the uh, stuff I did, I worked. There's six engines on a B-47, so I was able to work. Learned all six engines five airplane generals. I learned all five place, uh, uh, places. One of the unique things that happened in that particular squadron at the time, there was one point in time where there was nobody that was a first term airman in the squadron, or in the maintenance field anyway, in the docks, and nobody under the rank had under the rank of three stripes. It was probably the most professional group that I've worked with because nobody ever told you really what to do because everybody knew what they had to do. You know, you'd come in We'd tear the airplane apart in about 30 minutes after it got in the dock and uh, 4.30 come, clean up all the tools, parts, put the tools away, fill out paperwork and hit the road for another night. But uh, uh, we did pretty quality work. Uh, we had a lot of crew chiefs that were requesting uh, our particular dock uh, when the aircraft was scheduled into the docks because they knew what kind of work we did. Um, I also worked uh, aircraft recovery and towing, did some refueling, uh, very, very minimal on that though. And in 1961, we lost our B-47s uh, because they were going to put extra concrete on the runway for the B-52s that were coming in. Uh, I got sent to uh, Pinecastle Air Force Base, which was later on renamed McCoy to help maintain their B-47s while their troops went off to school to learn about the B-52. Uh, I spent about two or three months up at uh, McCoy, or Pine Castle. Uh, made tri several trips back to Miami to see my girlfriend at the time. Uh, and in, in 1962, or in the end of 61, I should say, we returned, went to tech school at Chinook Air Force Base uh, because at that time I cross-trained into the Hound Dog missile, which uh, is also known as the GAM-77 or the AGM-28B, which flew on the B-52 uh, in between the fuselage and the inboard engines. 
and I worked on that particular missile for four years. Uh, in 1962, I was married to my girlfriend at the time, uh, D. Irene Crossman. And in 1964, we had our first daughter, Lisa. And, oh, let me see. Uh, as I said, worked uh, on the Hound Dog. I worked on a, as a, a loading team supervisor, team chief. And we upload and download the missiles on the aircraft. Uh, performed under wing checks. I, I ran the engine because uh, I had a mechanical AFSC and another individual on my crew, he had the electronics, so he would run the nav navigation and guidance system uh, on the missiles while we did the under wing check on the Hound Dogs. One of the things that would make the A&E people, aircraft and electronics people, very mad is when their systems would go out and they would have to follow a hound dog back home. Uh, the two were kind of somewhat interconnected. What they would do is once they got airborne and programmed everything into the missiles, they put the missiles in what they called simulated launch. So the missiles thought they were flying on their own. And there's several times that the aircraft lost its navigation system. So that would kind of make them upset uh, when they would have to click onto a hound dog to, and follow the hound dog home using its navigation system. So uh, that that was <laughs> something I guess. Again, I guess. Uh, in 1960, I guess also I worked in uh, the production control. I worked in the hangar, doing hangar maintenance, uh, working on hydraulic systems, engines, things like that. Uh, uh, combined systems run, we had what they call a rock and roll table. We could put the missile on a, um, it was called a table. It, it could roll and pitch the missile, which made the missile think it was flying. And we ran the engine in a bay. Uh, then in 1966, uh, they were looking for people to go to Minuteman missiles. So I volunteered to cross train in the Minuteman. Uh, ended up in uh, Malmstrom Air Force Base. Great Falls, Montana. Uh, there, I did not go to technical school because um, my second child, daughter, de named Debbie, was uh, due to be born. Doctors didn't want me running off anywhere, so uh, they had signed me to a missile handling team, uh, strictly on the job training at the time. And what they did is sent four of us over to Grand Forks, North Dakota, to train on Minuteman 2. Uh, Malmson at the time had Minuteman 1, they were going to be getting Minuteman 2, so they needed some teams to go over there and learn the differences. It was supposed to be a three-week TDY, it turned into a six-week TDY because they wanted a team certified, so uh, it took a little bit extra time for us to get certified and evaluated and returned back. Uh, I stayed at Malmson for since 1966 to 1970. Um, I worked uh, the missile handling, missile handling team chief. Uh, worked in quality control, got selected to be a quality control inspector evaluator. Uh, did that again until I left in 1970 and I transferred down to Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri. Yeah. Malmstrom had 200 Minuteman missiles. Uh, Originally, there was uh, 150 Minuteman 1s and 50 Minuteman 2s. Eventually, they all became Minuteman 2s. And after I left even the Air Force, it became Minuteman 3. Uh, again, when I got to Whiteman, uh, signed missile handling, missile, became uh, missile handling team chief there again. Uh, got moved up to uh, NCIC of the section and had another. Uh, sergeant come in and outrank me and he became the shop chief, which was fine. I got selected again to go back to quality control, doing inspections, evaluation of the personnel and equipment. Uh, worked in various uh, other places within the quality control division. Got into the management inspections. Um, also worked in training controls, NCOIC the training control, it was NCOIC the analysis section, NCOIC the wing job control. Uh, and back to 
uh, quality control, and that's where I finished my career is uh, uh, NCIC, the wing quality control. Uh, retired in 1979 as an E-8 senior master sergeant. And uh, other than that, I don't know what <laughs> more I can say here. Uh, upon my retirement, I moved here to Kissimmee. My wife's grandparents lived here. Uh, her parents lived in Miami. We did not want to really go back to Miami. Um, being her grandparents lived here in Kissimmee, I uh, answered an ad in the paper for a job at Martin Marietta and never heard from them until I got here. And then a guy kept calling. I, we finally got together. I got hired and I worked for Martin Marietta for 14 years before I got laid off, retired, if you will. And I worked uh, several Army projects, Pershing Missile being one of them, and writing uh, maintenance tasks for the Army personnel. Uh, presently, I belong to not only the Tribute Museum here, but I also belong to an organization called uh, the Air Force Association of Missileers, uh, which is primarily made up of people that served in the Minuteman and Titan career fields and other missile systems throughout the history of the missile systems. and. Uh, uh, they, they claim that we're the winners of the Cold War. I'm not so sure about that, but uh, I do have to say that uh, I'm proud to have been a defender of this country and served my 23 years. Uh, although I never served overseas, I really have to say my hat's off to those that were on the front lines and stuff. I spent many a night, many days and hot summers, long hours, worked as high as 28 hours at a clip, uh, hauling a Minuteman missile, which weighed several thousand pounds. Our the vehicle we had was had 28 wheels on it, grossed out 122,000 pounds. The uh, missile was valued at over a million dollars, so was the equipment. So here you are, sit, going all over, especially in Montana was the hardest one because of the, the roads we had there. A lot of times the sites, the farthest site we had was 150 miles, and sometimes it could take almost eight hours to get just to get to the site. So it was a lot of responsibility doing that, working out. I've worked as low as 15 degrees below zero in the missile sites in Montana. I've seen it at 55 below zero uh, there. I've worked in 100 degree hot days in Missouri. So uh, it, it's been quite a haul. But uh, as again, I say I've been proud to serve this country and I uh, have to say freedom's not free. So I hope that the people that come behind me will take up the flag and defend the country like we did. Thank you.